Well, I think we're ready for looking at the survey of Jeremiah. I gave you the introductory notes if you'll turn in your Bibles to the book of Jeremiah. I think that's where we left off in survey. All right, let's get an outline. The first is the call of Jeremiah in chapter 1. We just kind of give you a working outline as we go. It almost seems a shame to rush through the prophets, but as I've said so many times, you can't do everything in a survey. But as we teach the books of the prophets, you'll see that we haven't even touched the book by survey. Let's look at chapter 1, his call, because it's quite significant in many ways, and I think that'll come out. The words of Jeremiah to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirtieth year of his reign. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, unto the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah. So he's living in the time of the downfall of Jerusalem. In fact, that's what his prophecy is dealing with. He's, uh, as I said last time, preaching the imminent fall of Jerusalem, saying it's too late for repentance. God says in uh, chapter 16 in the book that even if Noah, Job, and Daniel prayed, they could but save their own lives. So it's too late for repentance. And Jeremiah has one of those ministries that are not enviable. People say, I'd like to be a prophet or pray God will put him in that office. Well, he may put you in one like Jeremiah's where it was preaching nothing but judgment and destruction and what uh, Judah called treason because he recommended, and God, he was prophesying and over and over recommended they submit to the Babylonians and Nebuchadnezzar. He said, if you'll submit and not resist, God will take you into captivity, but your lives will be spared. Of course, they called that treason. Be like in America, going to Washington. Of course, without uh, laboring the point, we know that America's do her judgments. And so many visions and prophecies have said it will come from Russia and China. Many visions have shown Chinese marching up and down the streets in America. So if a prophet were sent to Washington and saying, submit to Russia and submit to China, those who do will not be kill, they'll spare their lives, God will spare their lives. Well, you can imagine how that would be received. Well, that's what Jeremiah had to do, and so he was arrested more than once, persecuted. They tried to kill him. He's called the weeping prophet. So the names here of Jehoiakim and Zedekiah are your last couple of kings. Actually, there was another one, Jehoiakim, but he reigned a very short time. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, verse 4, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. In other words, a prophet doesn't become a prophet after he's born. He's ordained to that office. And that, uh, that's without exception. Of course, that's true of your calling in the body of Christ, as far as that goes. God, uh, as we saw in biblical theology, God doesn't choose you after you're born. He doesn't fix his love upon you after you believe. But Ephesians 1, among many other chapters, said that you were chosen from before the foundation of the world to be a holy people. Well, he said, I've chosen you before you were ever formed in the womb. In other words, Jeremiah had a name before he existed, just like we did. Then said I, Ah, oh, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. So his call came early. The Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee. And whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Now he warns him ahead that he's going to be resisted. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. If you've kept up with your reading and you read Jeremiah, you can see how that could be a comfort to him through his ministry because he was resisted from the, by the other prophets, by the leaders, by the kings, everyone. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. So this is 
not just inspiration. This is the word of the Lord the prophet spoke. Remember, the Bible doesn't teach inspiration. It teaches expiration. The word of the Holy Scriptures are what God breathed out. Yes, the Bible is inspired. That isn't what we said. But that isn't the term the Bible uses. It uses expiration. The, all scriptures God breathed. Well, here it is, you see. He says, I put my words in your mouth. Now, a prophet could make a mistake, but God can. See, Peter, when he wrote First and Second Peter, is inspired. But when Paul had to admonish him for being unscriptural about withdrawing from the Gentiles when the Jews were around, uh, then you don't follow Peter there. You don't follow Peter in Matthew 16 when he's telling Christ not to go to the cross either. But you see, when God speaks, then it's infallible. And that's the thing you have to keep in mind. Prophets were sometimes inspired. The scriptures are always inspired. And there's a difference. Behold, I put my words in thy mouth. Let me just add parenthetically, because we've always got visitors that never have the background of all you're saying when you make statements like that. 1 Corinthians 14 says to judge every prophecy, you see. So if man were infallible, we wouldn't have to judge the prophecies. All right. Well, here's his ministry. I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down and to build and plant. Well, praise God. That's about all we can deal with this call because if you even get into the next verses, Jeremiah is rich in sermon material. But look at the state of Judah, chapter 2. Let me give you that outline. We've got prophecies against Judah and Jerusalem in chapters 2 through 45. Chapters 2 through 45. Prophecies against Judah and Jerusalem. That was his ministry to prophesy against Judah. And he wasn't saying, if you repent, something won't happen. He was declaring the imminent downfall of the nation. It was going to happen. Too late for repentance. But here's their condition, chapter 2. We see this all through the book. Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals, when thou wentest after me in the wilderness. He goes back now to the exodus and looks upon her as a virgin bride. Of course, she was anything but that, but God in his grace sees her that way. And how he favored her and how she loved him and then later became an unfaithful wife. He says, I remember the kindness of your youth, the love of your espousals, when you wentest after me in the wilderness, in a land that was not sown. Israel was holiness unto the Lord. And the first fruits of his increase, all that devour him shall offend. Evil shall come upon them, saith the Lord. Anyone who touches a Jew, remember the scriptures say, God will punish. That's Genesis 12, 1 to 3. Hear ye the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, What iniquity have your fathers found in me, that they have gone far from me, and have walked after vanity, and are become vain? Neither said they, Where is the Lord that brought us up out of the land of Egypt and led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and of pits, through a land of drought and the shadow of death, through a land that no man passed through and where no man dwelt? And I brought you up into a plentiful country to eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof. When you entered, you defiled my land and made mine heritage an abomination. The priests say not, Where is the Lord? In other words, nobody is looking for the Lord. They that handle the law knew me not. The pastors are tran also transgressed against me, and the prophets prophesied by Baal, and walked after things that do not profit. Wherefore I will yet contend with you, saith the Lord, and with your children's children will I contend. For pass over to the isles of Kittim, and see, and send them to Kedar, and consider diligently, and see if there be such a thing. In other words, he's saying, you can go all over the world, and you will find people that treat their false gods like you've treated me, the true God. Hath a nation changed their gods, which are yet no gods? But my people have changed their glory, meaning God, for that which does not profit. Be astonished, O ye heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be very desolate, saith the Lord. 
For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed themselves out cisterns, and broken cisterns at that, that can hold no water. Well, two evils. They've forsaken the living waters. Now, anyone who's ever tasted fresh water flowing from a spring in a stream doesn't like cistern water. That you, you drink that when you have to. And they, of course, shoot out the rock, and there's not a lot of rainfall in Palestine. I mean, it's periodic, but it's not like it's regular. And so they've always got cisterns all over the land. And then in a drought, that gets down to the breakish water, and it isn't too good. He says, no other people under heaven are as dumb, spiritually ignorant as they are. They've not only forsaken living waters and said we'd rather drink the stagnant water, but he says even the cisterns are broken, and there's no water in it. So they've got nothing, and they're false gods. Well, how many of you ever heard a sermon on chapter 2, verse 13? Ever been to church? Anybody ever been to church? Well, there's one lady, she's heard sermon. Yeah, that's sermon material. Broken cisterns. I think I got something on. Well, Jeremiah chapters 2 through 45 is just like that. Prophecy after prophecy of their sin and apostasy. Well, Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet. You might look at chapter 9, verses 1 to 2. Of course, you have to read the book to see how he laments all the way through the book. And of course, you know who wrote Lamentations. Oh, that my head were waters, and mine eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Oh, that I had in the wilderness a lodging place of wayfaring men, that I might leave my people and go for them. For they're all adulterers, an assembly of treacherous men. So there, so say he's called the weeping prophet, and you can see why. They wish he, his head was full of waters and his eyes a fountain of tears, because he just doesn't have enough to weep all he weeps. Over in chapter 12, I'm just trying to point out some interesting things because this whole section deals with prophecies concerning the fall of Jerusalem. But he laments all through the book. He started out in chapter 1 not wanting to go because he knew what the message would be. He's like Moses, a bit reluctant because it's just a message of judgment. Who wants to go preach nothing but judgment? Chapter 12, Righteous art thou, O Lord, when I plead with thee, yet let me talk with thee of thy judgments. He's really concerned about how wicked they are and the fact that God has not yet fulfilled his prophecies against Judah because of their sins. Wherefore doth the way of the wicked prosper? Wherefore are all men happy that deal very treacherously? Thou hast planted them, yea, they have taken root. They grow, yea, they bring forth fruit. Thou art near in their mouth, but far from their reins. But thou, O Lord, knowest me. Thou hast seen me and tried mine heart toward thee. Pull them out like sheep for the slaughter and prepare them for the day of slaughter. How long will the land mourn and the herbs of the field wither for the wickedness of them that dwell therein? The beasts are consumed, the birds, because they said, He shall not see our last end. The land is so utterly corrupt he can't understand why God hasn't already fulfilled his word against them. Well, look at what God tells him. Cheer up, Jeremiah. Things are going to get worse. <laughs> if thou hast run with the footmen, God answers him. If you run with the footmen and they have wearied thee, then how canst thou contend with the horses? And if in a land of peace wherein thou trustest they wearied thee, then how wilt thou do in the swelling of the Jordan? He said, you haven't seen anything yet. He said, if they're wearing you, if their present state and the present condition of the land is causing you trouble, you haven't seen anything yet. Cheer up, the worst is yet to come. So when you get to feeling sorry for yourself in the body or any of the word ministries, read Jeremiah. That'll cheer you up. <laughs> it'll, it'll never be as bad as the book of Jeremiah for you. Now, if you haven't read it in one sitting, then you ought to do it. That is, you know, two or three days get through the book because Jeremiah is just one whole lament. And then you can read Lamentations, which follows.
you want to be cheered up. <laughs> Chapter 13 deals with the linen girdle. He tells him to put on a nice linen girdle that's a belt, then take it to the river Euphrates and hide it in a hole in a rock, verse 4. And he did that, and then he told him to go back and get it, and it had rotted and come all apart. The girdle now, he says, of course, is no good for anything. Well, he says, that's the way my people are. Verse 9, after this manner will I mar the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem. That's what's called a symbolic act in chapter 13. Prophets often had to act out their prophecies. He'd bring that old rotted piece of cloth back and say, now this is what you're going to look like very shortly. This is what God's going to do to you. They were lifted up in their pride, wore nothing but the best, but he said it won't be long till you'll look like this. This whole section, chapter 2 to 45, consists of uh, a lot of discourses, and you can't really do justice to it. Chapter 16 is significant. Jeremiah was so close to the fall of Jerusalem and the captivity he was forbidden to marry. You sure you want to be a prophet? Some of you single men, you know, you say, well, I'd... people don't understand what is involved in being a prophet. They think it's just, well, that'd be a nice office to be in. But look at, look at Jeremiah, for example, here. He had nothing but a message of judgment. Then chapter 16, God tells him not to marry. Thou shalt not take thee a wife, neither shalt thou have sons or daughters in this place. Why? He would only see them perish, is what God is saying, because he's going to destroy the people. For thus saith the Lord concerning the sons and the daughters that are born in this place, and concerning the mothers that bear them, and concerning their fathers that begat them in this land, they shall die of grievous death. They shall not even be lamented. They shall not even be buried. So he's forbidden to marry. Chapter 17 has some familiar phrases that you hear often on the lips of Christians. The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron and with the point of a diamond. It's graven upon the tables of their heart. Verse 5, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man and maketh flesh his arm. We quote that one quite frequently. People think they couldn't get by without the doctor, lawyer, psychiatrist, counselor. Cursed be the man who trusts in man. Now that's God's word. And Christians are supposed to know God's word. Verse 7, but blessed be the man that trusts in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. He'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. There's Psalm 1 verse 3 in Jeremiah 17, 8. Same imagery. He'll be like a tree planted by the waters that spreadeth out her roots by the river and shall not see when heat cometh, but her leaf shall be green and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. Now, if you read Psalm 1 verse 3, you'll see that that imagery is there. Blessed is the man, and so forth and so on. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, who bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Well, Jeremiah lived after David, and he'd probably read Psalm 1. Of course, the Spirit can inspire them to give the same ideas in a little different wording. Many signs that Jeremiah gives. The sign of the potter, chapter 18. He says, I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessels that he made of the city were marred in the hand of the potter. He saw him making a vessel, a pot or a vase. And as he was making it, he marred it intentionally. You know, he just put his fist in it and made another ball of clay and started it over. That's the picture here. The vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again another vessel. As seemed good to the potter to make it. He just did whatever he wanted with the clay. And as he was watching this, the word of the Lord came to him saying, by the way, verse 2, God told him to go down to the potter. Why didn't he just give him a vision? Well, why don't you ask the Lord? That's the way he does things. He said, Arise, go down to the potter's house, and watch him make some vessels. And then while he was standing watching, he saw him mar a vessel he was making, and he made something else out of it. Just whatever he wanted to do with it, he could do. Then the word of the Lord came. It was a sign. O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord. 
Anybody here doubt God's sovereignty? <laughs> Buy you a Bible. Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand, O house of Israel. At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, to pluck up and to pull down and destroy it, if that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will turn from the adversity that I thought to do to them. I'm just translating the Hebrew and not King James mixed up English. It says he'll repent of the evil. Other verses say he doesn't repent. And of course God can't do evil. So the words mean that. I will turn concerning the judgment or adversity that I thought to do them. At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build or to plant it. If it do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then I will turn from the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. So we have the sign of the potter's wheel, chapter 18. There's so much here. Here's one of, uh, by the way, he's arrested more than once and imprisoned. Once he's put down in a slime pit, sinks down in it up to his knees or waist. They leave him there to die, and God delivers him. But here's another imprisonment because he's preaching the destruction of Jerusalem. And so Pasher smote Jeremiah, verse 2, the prophet, and put him in the stocks that were in the high gate of Benjamin, which was by the house of the Lord. And it came to pass on the morrow that Pasher brought forth Jeremiah out of the stocks. Now one thing about this ministry, Jeremiah wasn't afraid to preach it. It wasn't pleasant. And here's where some people may have learned their lesson and kept their mouth shut. But as soon as they let him out of the stocks, verse 3, Then Jeremiah said to him, The Lord hath not called thy name Pasher, but Magor Misabib. You know what that means? Well, he tells you. For thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will make thee a terror to thyself. I mean, he'll, he'll be so bad off, he'll be afraid to look in the mirror. And to all thy friends, and they shall fall by the sword of their enemies, and thine eyes shall behold it, and I'll give all Judah into the hand of the king of Babylon. He just goes right on preaching. They fall to Babylon. He shall carry them captive into Babylon, shall slay them with the sword. Moreover, I will deliver all the strength of this city and all the laborers thereof, and all the precious things thereof. And all the treasures of the kings of Judah will I give to the hand of their enemies, which shall spoil them and take them and carry them to Babylon. And thou, Pasher, and all that dwell in thine house shall go into captivity. Thou shalt come to Babylon, and there thou shalt die. And shall be buried there, thou and all thy friends to whom thou hast prophesied lies. So it didn't learn a thing from his imprisonment. <laughs> like seminary, I attended. Uh, they can stand anything but in a conservative somebody who takes the word of God literally. I never did hide my views is why I stayed in trouble. I didn't make a nuisance of myself, but when they found out I was conservative, that was all about a doctor's degree there. They came to me the first semester and asked me to work on a doctor's degree. They never do that. It was God allowing it as a temptation if I'd keep my mouth shut, you see. Those are some of the little temptations we haven't told you about. If you keep quiet, you can earn the highest degree in the land. Well. So I remember in one of the classes, one of the professors said that one fellow went through here and just act like he was believing everything we taught him. And then the day he graduated, had his doctor's degree in his hand, he went down the halls. Now, praise God, I can go preach what I believe. <laughs> they said, we don't want any more like that. <laughs> but I'm not persuaded that's the way to do it. Because there were just some classes you'd have to reveal your beliefs are compromising. Well, what he went on to say, and he didn't learn a thing. Went through the school and didn't learn a thing. He, he kept his views about the inspiration of Scripture, so, so they said he didn't learn a thing. So Jeremiah didn't learn a thing. He just went right on preaching the same message. But he tries to, you know, he, he suffers nothing but imprisonment and punishment. His own family was against him. So he says, Lord, you've deceived me. Now that word is to be taken in with the idea, Lord, you didn't tell me how bad it was, is what he means. And I was deceived. You're stronger than I am. You've prevailed. I'm in derision daily. Everyone mocketh me. 
For since I spake, I cried out, I cried out violence and spoil, because of the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me and a derision daily. Then I said, I will not make mention of him. I'll just quit preaching, he said. I'll not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name. It causes him nothing but trouble. Well, he said, when I tried to do that, God's word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. <laughs> he said he had to preach. Well, if you've been called, you have to preach. Jonah tried to run away from it, but he didn't get too far. God prepared a fish to remind Jonah of his call. Very significant prophecies over in chapter 25. We have an actual prediction of the number of years he'll be in captivity by Jeremiah the prophet. So we saw last time Daniel the prophet, after 70 years, knew when to start praying, and we're told that praying for Israel's restoration, and we're told that he was able to do that because he had the book of scroll of Jeremiah in his possession. Jeremiah 25, 11, he says, This whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and the nations shall serve the king of Babylon seventy years. Now there's where we have it prophesied before it happened. Now, to show you what he was up against in chapter 28, none of the other prophets prophesied 70 years captivity. They were prophesying lies and out of their own heart. You'll find many, many pulpits filled with men are saying what the people want to hear. Second Timothy 4 says they will. They'll say what the people want to hear. But Hananiah, the prophet, now he's a prophet. Look at what he says in chapter 28, verse 2. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts. He said, Thus saith the Lord, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon, and within two full years will I bring again into this place all the vessels of the Lord's house that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took away from this place and carried them to Babylon. Now he's prophesied. There were actually three deportations. 606, that's the one Daniel went in. 597, that's the one Ezekiel went in, and then the actual finish of Nebuchadnezzar's conquest of the land in 586. There were three deportations. And this prophecy comes after the first or second, where Nebuchadnezzar has already taken all the treasures of King Solomon's temple, but the city is still standing. The temple hasn't been destroyed yet. His prophecy is... And by the way, Nebuchadnezzar took a lot of captives. He took the best, the royal line and the nobles and all that in his first two captivities. Then the third one, he just took everybody but the poor and the sick and left them in Palestine. But what Hananiah is prophesying here after the first or second deportation, uh, that in two years God will restore them. And remember, Jeremiah has already prophesied seven years. Verse 5, the prophet Jeremiah said to the prophet Hananiah in the presence of the priests and the people, even the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen, the Lord do so. The Lord perform your words, which was, you know, just the opposite of what he had said, that they'll return in two years instead of 70. He said, The Lord perform your words, which thou hast prophesied to bring again the vessels of the house of the Lord from Babylon. Nevertheless, hear thou now this word that I speak in thine ears and in the ears of all the people. And that's the test of a prophet. He's willing to go against the mainstream, if that is, if he has a word from the Lord. And then he says, if I've not spoken to the Lord, it won't come to pass. But he isn't afraid to put his prophecy out where people can look at it and examine it and watch it be fulfilled or not fulfilled. He says, hear all you people, the prophets that have been before me and before thee of old prophesied both against many countries and against great kingdoms of war, of evil, and pestilence. He said, all the prophets before me preached judgment against sin. And of course, Judah is so terribly sinful that Jeremiah could preach nothing else, you see. So he said, that's what all the former prophets preach, judgment against sin. Therefore, the prophet which prophesies peace in the midst of sin, of course, when the word of that prophet shall come to pass, then that prophet shall be known that the Lord has truly sent him. He said, you're prophesying peace. And he said, let history test it. 
Then Hananiah the prophet took the yoke from off the prophet Jeremiah's neck. Jeremiah had put a yoke around his neck showing in a symbolic way that Jerusalem was going into the yoke of captivity, bondage. So he took it and he broke it. Verse 12, he broke the yoke off his neck. Jeremiah said, You've broken the yokes of wood, but thou shalt make for them yokes of iron. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I've put a yoke of iron upon the neck of all these nations. Then the prophet Jeremiah said to Hananiah the prophet, verse 15, Hear the word of the Lord. The Lord has not sent you, but you make the people to believe a lie. Therefore thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will cast thee from off the face of the earth. This year thou shalt die. Well, if God's speaking to Jeremiah, they won't have long to wait to see if that's the word of the Lord. This year you'll die because you've taught rebellion against the Lord. So Hananiah the prophet died the same year in the seventh month. So we see who's the true prophet. Had you been there, which one would you know was the true prophet? Now, if you were spiritual, you'd know Jeremiah is speaking to the Lord because he was preaching judgment against sin. But most people, I didn't say many, most in the churches would have followed Hananiah. Most would have followed him. They did in Israel, they still do it. Who wants to hear judgment? Oh, God, he wouldn't be a God of love. He punished us for 70 years. Two years would be long enough. We're not really that bad. He understands. He knows we're but flesh. You ever heard all of that? Well, yeah. you've been to church, you have. So we had to wait 70 years to see if Jeremiah was right. But in two years, they didn't come back. That proved Hananiah wrong. So there were two prophecies there that proved him wrong. Well, the outline from 2 to 45 is dealing with just such prophecies. It's interesting that in chapter 39 of Jeremiah, you do have the fall of Jerusalem recorded. It happened just like he said. The ninth year of Zedekiah, he's the last king. If you look at your chart on prophets and kings, you'll see Zedekiah was the last king of Judah. The ninth year of Zedekiah came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all the army against Jerusalem, they besieged it. This is the third time Nebuchadnezzar has come. And in the eleventh year of Zedekiah, in the fourth month, the ninth day of the month, the city was broken up, and all the princes of the king of Babylon came in. Verse 4, And it came to pass that when Zedekiah, the king of Judah, saw them, and all the men of war, then they fled and went forth out of the city by night by the way of the king's gate, by the gate betwixt the two walls, and he went out the way of the plain. And Jeremiah, as you read this prophecy, had previously told him, Don't resist, don't try to flee, and God will spare your life, you and your family. But Zedekiah was afraid uh, to hearken Jeremiah and trust the Lord. And so the Chaldean army pursued them as they were fleeing and overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho. When they had taken him, they brought him to Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. And the king of Babylon slew the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes. And the king of Babylon slew all the nobles of Judah. Moreover, he put out the eyes of Zedekiah and bound him with chains and carried him to Babylon. And the Chaldeans burned the king's house and the house of the people with fire and break down the walls of Jerusalem. Then Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried away captive into Babylon the remnant of the people that remained in the city and those that fell away and fell to him with the rest of the people that remained. But Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, left the poor of the people which had nothing in the land of Judah and gave them vineyards and fields. And then they leave Jeremiah because word got out to Nebuchadnezzar that he was preaching that Nebuchadnezzar was going to take Jerusalem. So Nebuchadnezzar didn't take Jeremiah in the captivity, left him back. That didn't make him any more popular with people, by the way. <laughs> be, be like the... Uh, leader of the communists coming over here and because you or I prophesied this was going to happen or they spared your life. It doesn't make you any more popular with the people when they see their loved ones carried off and their, them being carried off. But Jeremiah's troubles are not over because they left him there and then he kept prophesying and the governor and leaders at Nebuchadnezzar set over Palestine. When he would conquer land, he would carry the people and the treasures captive, but he would leave occupation forces there and so forth. 
and set up his own leaders. And they continued to persecute Jeremiah, in fact, carried him down into Egypt. So he prophesied down in Egypt. That brought us through chapter 45 in a kind of a survey fashion. And chapters 46 to 51 are prophecies against the foreign nations. 46 to 51. All of the major prophets have a large section of the book against foreign nations. 46 to 51, prophecies against foreign nations, against Egypt and Moab and Ammon and so forth. And then chapter 52 is a historical appendix. Historical appendix. Well, that gives you a little insight to his ministry. And the outline can help you as you read to see what you're dealing with. <clears throat> that chapter 52 is interesting. Keep that in mind if you haven't read that yet to read that. That brings us to Ezekiel. At least we can get started on Ezekiel. I don't know why I thought I was going to cover Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel in one lesson. <laughs> I must have dreamed that. This is the second week, and we're about out of time and getting ready to start on Ezekiel. All right, the book is named for its author. And again, I don't know where to get it in the English. In the Hebrew, it's Y-E-C-H-E-Q -E or K. I'll make it a K. It's about the same. K -E -E -K -E -K -E -K -E that's a long E. Yekekel. Can you get Ezekiel out of that? You want it in the Hebrew. Some of you write Hebrew. That's a Zion. Yekezkel. Yekezkel. I must have left something out somewhere. I left that Zion out. Sorry. Y E C H. E, and we're supposed to have a Z right in here. I'm sorry, it goes right in here. Yekezkeo. That sounds better. But still not Ezekiel. Yekezkeo. Ezekiel was a priest. Jeremiah was also of a priestly family. Now, if you're wondering why we're not looking at Lamentations, that comes under the writings. We're only dealing with the major, minor prophets. The Hebrew Bible puts, uh, like Daniel, puts Daniel under the writings and uh, Lamentations comes under another heading. Ezekiel was a priest. He was deported to Babylon in 597 B.C together with King Jehoiakim. Then one followed him, Jehoiakim. So don't confuse the two. He only reigned a very, very short time, I think six months, Jehoiakim. But he was deported with King Jehoiakim. Remember the three deportations. Daniel had gone in 606 B.C. with the first group of captives. Daniel was of royal blood. That's why they took him. Jeremiah was from a priestly family, and Ezekiel was a priest as well as a prophet. He was deported in 597. According to chapter 24, his wife died the day Jerusalem fell. Another sign. Still want to be a prophet? The Lord said to Ezekiel, today your wife dies. Don't even mourn her. Today Jerusalem falls. She'll be a sign. All want to be prophets. Don't study the prophets. You'll get discouraged unless you are willing to take it on God's terms. Of course, I speak that way to make a point. You don't make yourself a prophet. But some people have visions of grandeur or something about the office. He may tell you to go prophesy to your in-laws Are to your best friend, thus saith the Lord. 
remember Jeremiah had no friends. Even his family opposed him. He said, arrest that man. <laughs> All right, the prophet's wife died according to chapter 24. He's in Babylon, remember? She dies, and he knows the day the city falls. That's one of the ways he knows. He begins his ministry in 593, the fifth year of his captivity. He doesn't begin to prophesy. He's a priest, remember, carried captive. And he, God gives him a vision and a call there to be also a prophet. He can't function as a priest in Babylon, obviously. So we'll date his prophecy 593 B.C. We're giving you dates for all the prophets. That's the beginning, approximate date of the beginning of their ministries. He was a contemporary of Jeremiah. Remember, the prophets didn't prophesy one, two, three, four, five in that order. Many of them prophesied together, as we told you last time. He's a contemporary of Jeremiah. And what Jeremiah is preaching in Jerusalem, the downfall of the city and the nation, Ezekiel's preaching the same message in Babylon to the captives there. Same message. Daniel's over there too, but he isn't preaching that. He has a unique ministry. God's giving him revelations and visions concerning end time events. Establishment of the kingdom of God, the overthrow of the Gentile kingdoms of the world. But Daniel has already established a reputation by the time Ezekiel gets there. He's already in the king's court prophesying. There's a key phrase throughout Ezekiel. If you read it, you might have already discovered it. They shall know that I am God. Everything he says, he says, I'm doing this because then they'll know that I am God. It occurs over 60 times in Ezekiel. In other words, God's not trying to uh, tell them to do anything. He's just telling them now, it's too late for repentance. I'm showing you what I'm going to do. Then you'll know that I'm God. And all these false gods that you went after are not gods. Occurs over 60 times. Now, assuming you've read Ezekiel sometime in your life, and I trust in connection with this course, and I know that that's a lot of reading to try to keep up, but do the best you can. But if you've read Ezekiel, perhaps you noted that this is where the book of Revelation gets much of its symbolism. See, God inspired the whole Bible so he can do what he wants, and he takes much of the symbolism out of Revelation out of the Old Testament, and much of it comes out of Ezekiel. He gets the living creatures out of chapter 1 of Ezekiel in Revelation. The description is almost uh, identical. Ezekiel 1, Revelation 4. Chapter 20 of Revelation speaks of Gog and Magog. That comes right out of chapter 39 of Ezekiel. Gog and Magog. John was told to eat the book of prophecy and then go prophesy it. And that's what Ezekiel had to do. He told him to eat the book. And then he'd have the word in him. New Jerusalem comes out of Ezekiel. Chapter 21, 22 of Revelation. New Jerusalem from Ezekiel. The river of the water of life in Ezekiel, in Revelation 22, comes out of Ezekiel. And of course more. That's just some of the little tidbits. So when you read Revelation, you're not reading, well, when you read the New Testament, let me say. That's why we insist that people know they're old because this is where the New Testament writers are getting much from the old. Oh, that's easily demonstrated. People come along and think that Jesus just invented everything, just pulled it out of the clouds, you know. He was a remarkable student of the Old Testament. Remember when he was 12, he was answering questions and asking questions. And he came up with a commandment to say, oh, Jesus invented that. Well, he did in the fact he inspired it as a pre-incarnate Christ, but I mean in his earthly ministry when he said, love your neighbors yourself. 
Oh, you'd never find anything like that in the Old Testament. It was right in the middle of the law. Love your neighbor as yourself. Leviticus 17. That's right in the law, Leviticus. So see what I mean? It's, uh, and Peter and Paul, they get, well, we quoted you last time. When he ascends on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Paul got that right out of the Old Testament. It's a direct quotation. And yet we quote it in Ephesians 4 like Paul dreamed it up. Or, you know, in the sense that it was just uh, New Testament revelation. There is nothing new in the Old Testament, absolutely nothing except the church, which is three times we're told it was a mystery and not revealed until the end of time. Well, I'm not trying to sell you on Old Testament, but you'll never be an expositor of the new without knowing it thoroughly. I just don't, to use a figure of speech, have patience with people who say it's old, it's done away with. We've even got end time teachers who make statements like that. It's just part of their Baptist or Methodist background where they've been taught it's old. It isn't old, it's older. It's the foundation of it. Nothing at all you believe out there about basic truth and doctrine that I can't show you teaching on in the Old Testament. Clear teaching, just name it. Salvation, baptism, Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues. Whole bit. Pentecost healing, deliverance, any doctrine, justification, regeneration. Why, it's right in Ezekiel. Jesus said to Nicodemus, what do you mean you don't understand the new birth? He said, these th you're a teacher of Israel. These things you ought to have known. That's what he said to him. New birth isn't new. Ezekiel's full of it. And then that takes care of that. has heresy that the Old Testament saints were unregenerate. Can you imagine that? Abraham running around. The example of faith in unregenerate man. <laughs> That's actually taught by some people. Well, I'm going to stay with the word. I'll tell you, friends, there's no substitute for knowing the Old Testament. You, people won't make some of the statements they do if they just know the word of God. It's that simple. Praise the Lord.